Thanks for having me back. I'm in a different capacity this time. I'm sitting in a big comfy chair in my living room. And uh, I'm grateful that all of you that are attending tonight, because um, for those of you that were at my presentation last year at the library, number one, I was having a hard time talking, so my voice is no problem tonight, which may, I don't have any cough drops, which is really nice. But also for any of the newcomers that might, um, there we go. For any of the newcomers, um, I, I will give a brief background of Swank and then get into some ways that we can minimize waste um, and recover resources and to talk about some of the, the safety precautions during the COVID-19 time that have changed um, with what I'm seeing in, in the industry um, to give you insight into that. Um, so basically the uh, presentation will have a little bit of background for the agency, ways to minimize waste, um, certainly how to recycle right and how to recycle right during the COVID-19 times as well as composting. Um, it's spring, it's so nice to, I have my big window here, it's so nice to see the flowers and the trees and the buds and we all want to be outside and gardening and landscaping can be something that we can all do um, to help our mental health as well as preserve um, our soil and, and bring beauty around us. So thanks for joining us tonight. Okay, let me share my presentation. I had yeah, this thanks, up for, earlier. thanks for doing this, Mary. It's, this is great to have you here. This is a nice plan B. If I can't be with you in person, at least it's a nice way to stay connected. Very grateful for the opportunity, Nancy. And just to verify, you can see my presentation on screen. Yes. Yep. And hear me fine before yes. I go on? Okay, great. Friends, if anybody's having, I'm sorry, Mary, if anybody's having trouble with seeing or hearing, you can type a message also um, in that chat box and let me know and I'll, I'll address it. Okay. So for any newcomers, the Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County is a unit of local government. It's an intergovernmental agency that's comprised of 23 suburbs that was formed in 1988. So the sole purpose is to aggregate residential solid waste, known as garbage, from households and to have it all come to a central location for efficiencies and cost control and environmental control. Um, in 1994, Swank opened the Glenview Transfer Station in the bottom right picture where the municipal solid waste comes to. There it's transferred onto a trailer that gets um, transported up to a landfill near Rockford. It's a landfill that um, Waste Connection owns. It's called Winnebago Landfill. Um, daily resources are discarded at this transfer station um, without much thought sometimes. Um, things that could have been reused, recycled, as we know, and certainly could have maybe been pr prevented by buying more durable um, items um, to the tune of 262 million tons nationally. In Illinois, our waste is all buried um, in a landfill. None of it is incinerated. And in the Swank region alone, last year, 250, almost 253,000 tons of solid waste um, was generated. These are the 23 communities that belong to Swank. They are members. We are under collectively a project use agreement for the services that the agency provides um, and the transfer of the garbage. Um, and it represents about 800,000 people or 230,000 households. It's a substantial region. It's not all Cook County, but is mostly in the north and northwest Cook County area, um, as kind of indicated with this little arrow here in this, this, this part where Evanston goes up to Barrington over to Elk Grove Village. Um, the line here is Mount Prospect, Park Ridge, Niles. So you can see all of the, um, the member communities. As we know, it's important to have 
ways to manage the waste that we no longer need that has potential harm to our environment, to our health, but so oftentimes needlessly resources are being thrown away. And so that's what I'd like to talk about tonight is our ways that we can minimize and prevent waste and certainly look at recycling right. Something about the garbage before we go on um, about how not to make it is just to caution you during the COVID-19 um, haulers, no matter who you have. So if you're listening in from Arlington Heights or Palatine or one of the other Swank communities that are not Elk Grove Village, um, any hauler that has a municipal contract is asking residents to bag your garbage and to seal it, to tie it off before it goes into the cart. And really, everything has been going along pretty well. Um, companies were concerned about not having enough employees, about getting an overabundance of garbage. People are home cleaning things out. Um, the one thing that has changed in pickup service is the large items that you place next to the cart um, have not been picked up. Um, that was something that they wanted to just monitor for right now and to let be. Um, notices were sent out, hopefully you got one, to say don't put out a couch, don't put out a chair, don't put out a mattress, don't put out anything that doesn't fit into the garbage can right now. And what we're hearing is starting next week, the week after, in fact, next, Waste Management just committed to Monday to starting to pick up bulk items again, and Waste Management is uh, the company that services Elk Grove Village. So hopefully that will get back on track. But I think um, anytime you throw something away in the garbage, it's probably prudent to put it in a bag that is secure and tied because sometimes that's the whole idea of garbage is it can have potentially harmful um, bacteria, germs, and we don't want that in our communities. And um, it just keeps it together better, longer, if you do it that way. But really what we wanna talk about is sustainable, sustainable materials management. And that begins with not making waste in the first place. And I like this slide because it talks about rethink first. What is it that you're buying? Do you need it? How many do you have? Can you borrow it? Um, do you have to buy it now? Um, and look at your choices. Look for durable things rather than something that is price point low and you can use for the moment, but it's not gonna last very long. So it's really about that conscious level as a consumer to really think about what it is that you need to purchase and what you need to buy. And then sometimes just say, you know what, I really don't need it. That, that week or two weeks of saying, all right, if I really need it, really want it, I'll go back in two weeks rather than making the impulse buy. So refuse is a good one. And those two come obviously before reduce. And reduce is about not making garbage in the first place. Um, refer, looking at stuff we already have, trying to refurbish and repair some of the old things, um, and repurpose, use things in a different way for something else. And then comes recycle. Recycle is a piece of the sustainable materials management, but it is not just for the sake of recycling, it's for, to achieve an environmental um, benefit. So a good place to start is to improve upon your purchases. And as I mentioned, look for durable, reusable goods for meetings, parties, work, school, lunches, and personal life instead of disposable one-time use items. Um, Single-use plastics and other type of litter is a global problem that negatively impacts wildlife, and it also um, our ecosystems and sometimes our food chain. And so what this graphic shows on um, the plastics that come from fossil fuels, and it does have a big carbon footprint. Um, plastics never degrade. They get smaller, they get into little pieces, which is why they get into the bellies of many of our animals because 
wildlife and fish can't differentiate between plankton sometimes in little pieces of plastic. And that's what happens to the plastic with the ultraviolet rays. They just break down into tiny pieces. And it's hard to manage and it's hard to, to um, quantify to, to scoop it up. Um, nearly 300 million tons of plastic is produced each year, half of which is single use for single use items, water bottles, um, cutlery, plates, cups, and more than 9 million tons of plastic ends up in our ocean each year. And I think that's even on a lower side from some, some statistics that I've recently heard. So again, Wildlife can't differentiate. Sometimes it entraps our wildlife and our fish or our birds. Um, and certainly, if we all go to get a test, they claim that in a year we, we consume the amount of a credit card of plastic, if it yeah. could be quantified. So not only is it in our food chain, it's also in our bloodstream and in our bodies. There are good things that plastic have done for our environment. We look at medical, we look at transportation. Um, I hate to say that plastic is the devil because it's not. It's been a very helpful material for certain situations and for certain products. And it's lightweighted some things. However, um, in our environment, it is in invasive. In our bodies, it's invasive. And so, by cutting down on the single use um, is a good way that we can help guard against um, having it be litter and certainly have it be not recycled and um, loose. So um, reuse and repair, repurpose, very close second to reduce not making garbage. Um, oftentimes price points of products are lower than sometimes fixing our, especially our electronics. So it's easier to just dump it and go, you know, to trash it and go buy something else. And so what I've been seeing cropping up, and it's been based on a lot of European countries in the middle here, are free repair clinics. It's a community event. It's a collaborative effort between citizens, um, young and old, and everything in between. Um, what do you know how to do? And what kind of service do you need? And you match those skills and you have a day of um, putting things together and fixing things rather than trashing them. So Evanston has been successful in doing this. Well, Met had one last year and we're starting to see them um, in other communities as well. Very creative way to try and repair, repurpose. Um, before trashing. There are other um, ways to reuse. Donation is a big part of our offcasts. Gently use things that we no longer need can go to an organization, can go to a neighbor, can go to garage sales. It's that time of year. And it can be put on neighborhood chats to give to people. All different kinds of ways to, um, when we no longer need something to do find a, a new owner. One person's trash is another person's treasure. They make TV shows about it even. And then I have up here a couple things I thought were really nice. Um, whether it's in your workplace or in your place of worship, there are um, schools do it all the time. They have little corners to where they have um, containers for different materials that have recycling or reuse programs, but they can't be put in the curbside cart. Um, so by collecting separately and mailing them in or dropping them off, there's some opportunities. Um, Swank's Closing the Loop brochure has a lot of the different um, programs, the companies and the organizations that do niche reuse and recycling kinds of things. Um, and then this is a board of reusable name tags. If you can see my arrow, it's white on white, some maybe not. Um, and this happens to be at a church. And when you enter, you pull your name tag, and when you're done, you put, hang it back on the wall. I just thought that that was kind of interesting. And then it, down here, the slides are about, um, some of your neighbors have the simple recycling program, although it's temporarily suspended due to the COVID-19 right now, it will resume. And when it does, it's about being able to put your gently used items I mean, even some of your crummy stuff um, into a bag, that bag gets put out on trash day, recycling day, and it gets picked up and it gets sorted, separated, 
um, brokered locally, it goes um, to other states, and then it goes to other countries. And if you're interested in that type of um, stream to follow, I really highly recommend reading Secondhand by Adam Mentor. He had done a previous book called Junkyard Planet about electronics. And this one is about secondhand, um, mostly textiles and clothing and shoes, but it also talks about cars and it talks about electronics going to third world countries where um, they're able to repair things and have things that they normally couldn't afford to purchase new. And it really is a thriving economy. And even though it might not be standards of what we're used to, it really lends itself to um, creating jobs and getting people goods um, in a different way. So if you've been home cleaning out your closets, your garage, your basement, um, you probably have different things um, separated. You might have some garments to, to donate to Goodwill or Salvation Army or Savers or Purple Heart, something like that. You might have um, household hazardous chemicals that I'll address in a little bit. Um, but if you do have things to donate to one of the organizations, they're closed right now as we are all at home. So please do not deliver them and leave them outside. That becomes a whole health and nuisance um, issue um, for the, the towns. Please hang on to them. Things will eventually reopen. We are not gonna be at home forever. And just be patient with the nice things that you have because they will be able to be donated down the road. And I'm sure there may be some new protocols on what can be taken, um, how much can be taken, because I'm sure these organizations are going to be bombarded by everybody's goods. Um, so call ahead, um, look at Swank's green pages, our recycling, reuse and recycling directory has many locations listed um, locally for you to call, let your fingers do the walking, as we used to say in the yellow pages. Um, so you know exactly what to expect when um, the time comes to donate your good things. So where do we stand with um, recycling in COVID-19? There's a couple things that I really wanted to um, bring up tonight. And that is how, um, the recyclers, I sometimes will refer to haulers because there they're are transporters, whether they're doing your solid waste or your recycling. Your, your service pr um, provider, um, no matter who it is, asks that if anybody in the household has symptoms of the COVID-19 um, virus or flu kind of some symptoms, please do not recycle. Refrain from recycling. Put your recyclables in with your garbage as hard as that might be and seal them and throw them in the garbage for the duration of why, you're, why you are showing symptoms and while you're ill. Um, and then when you feel better, go back to recycling as usual. There's a lot still yet to be discovered with this virus and how long it's somebody who is ill and infected and how long that virus might stay on, on different surfaces. So it's just best right now to be prudent, to be safe, um, and to keep everybody safe um, by just throwing the recycling away if someone in your house or you have been, are, are sick. And when you're feeling better, then you can resume to recycling. And please, please, please do not throw masks, gloves, or any kind of tubing from a medical equipment um, into the recycling bin. They are finding many of these things and they don't belong there. There are germs associated with them. Those things um, should be thrown away in the garbage, in your sealed garbage bag. Nancy, I'm gonna go back to you. Do you have your poll question? Oops, yes I do. Hold on one second. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I had myself muted. Okay, let's see, hold on a second. All right, here's a polling question for you all. Um, 
you should be able to, I don't remember how many seconds I allowed for this, so um, please vote on what is the proper way to put recyclables in your recycle bin, either loose or in a plastic bag. So um, let's see, almost got about five of us have answered. Um, so we're almost there, think about that and then we'll I'll reveal the answer in a second. One more person can vote. Um, if anybody hasn't voted yet, I'll give you a couple more seconds to make your choice. Okay. All right. So I'm going to end the poll here. And so our, most of you said loose um, to is the way to put them in the bin. And one of you said in a plastic bag. So Mary, Oops, I don't think I shared the results here. Oh. What is the proper way, Mary? So the answer is on this next slide, Nancy. Okay. It says um, materials go in cart loose. No plastic bags whatsoever. No plastic bags themselves and no recycling in plastic bags, not in curbside recycling. In fact, if <clears throat> What, what we hear from the recyclers is if they go to lift, or if they go to lift recycling and it, it's in plastic bags, um, those plastic bags will be picked out and put in the garbage. Whether it be in a split truck, some, some companies have split trucks and others, they wait till it goes to the MRF. So it's really important no longer ever to put any kind of plastic bag in your curbside cart. Mary, can you kind of like go through those pictures and describe like how you would refer to those? Because I know when I've heard you do that before, it just helps me better identify stuff that, you know, in my own house when I'm like, okay. Sure. And that. then I also have another slide because you may say, I don't see this or I don't see that. And I'm not with you and I don't have all my visuals. So I have another slide to really talk about some of the common things that we're finding in recycling carts, <coughs> excuse me, that shouldn't be. So um, let me go through um, this list here. So materials going cart loose, empty and clean. Empty means empty and clean means clean. No food residue, no beverage residue. So for plastics, um, I have been part of the Illinois Task Force for Recycling Contamination the last couple of years, and it's a stakeholder group of all of the major and even smaller um, recyclers. They're MRF operators, material recovery facility operators, um, local, state, and regional representatives like myself, and we all sat down together to vet the operators to say, what are you able to process? Because not all MRFs are created equal. Um, you have to have three things for recycling. You have to have a quantity of one material. You have to have the technology to sort it. And then you need to have a market to sell it, to make it into a new product. So those are the three key pieces for recycling. And something that you won't find on here are those little the numbers, the one through seven and the little chasing arrows, the recyclers have asked us not to use those numbers because they were, um, it, it's industry information. It gives re plastic recyclers the code of what that plastic is made from because all plastics are made of a different DNA, a polymer resin, and they melt differently and they, they react differently and they act differently. So. Um, those codes were for plastics recyclers, not for consumers like you and me. And they are oftentimes confusing because you'll see a number four on a plastic bag. And so you say, oh, it's a number four. I can put it in my recycling cart. And that's where I think a lot of the confusion and a lot of the contamination levels have risen because of that phenomenon. So on this chart, there are no numbers. Um, we're going back to descriptions. So for plastics, it's plastic bottles. It's plastic bottles that you have tea, you have soda, you have Gatorade, you have water, um, those kinds of things. Um, and you can empty and then when it's clean, empty and rinsed, you can put the lid back on and that actually helps hold the um, 
the container from being crushed too dramatically. So when it does get to where it gets sorted, it won't be, um, the optical sorter won't see it flat like paper and put it in the fiber side of life. It'll keep its dimension and then it will be recycled as a bottle. The number, the recycled plastic bottles, so many of them are not being recovered. And that is the most utilized and demanded plastic for remanufacturing and making new products from a, a brand sponsor or a brand buyer. So please don't let those go to waste and make sure they, they get on the conveyor belt and they get sorted properly by empty, clean, and leave the lid back on. So we have bottles, we have jugs, we have laundry detergent bottles, we have milk jugs. Those are types of jugs and you can also put the lids back on those. I just don't have them in the picture. And then there are tubs, which would be this yogurt container. And in this, I don't have a jar. If I had my visuals, I'd have a peanut butter jar. So it's bottles, caps on, tubs, jugs, and jars. And I'm only going to do positive. I'm not going to really talk about the negative yet because I have a whole slide of knots. So plastics, bottles, jugs, tubs, and jars, no foam. So then we have glass, all colors, um, bottles and jars for the lids of a jar, like a pickle jar, as long as it's three inches in diameter or greater, you can recycle it. Please don't recycle your bottle caps from soda or beer bottles. Um, they are small and they will jam equipment and recyclers have asked to keep those out. And if you can't find a way to repurpose them um, into magnets or some fun things, repurposing them, um, please throw them away. And then we have metal. There's both steel and aluminum. For steel, we have things like um, the soup cans, um, the, the bean cans, the hairspray bottle, and also the shaving cream. Now these are aerosol sprays. As long as they're completely empty, you can recycle them. And the Steel Recycling Institute wants that recycling back. The recyclers really aren't crazy about aerosols because if you haven't emptied them, they can explode. They're under pressure. So that's why it's really important. Um, just the other day, I was finishing off whipped cream. And even though it sputtered and, you know, on the plate, I took it over to the sink. And for probably another minute, it's, it had some, some, some air left in it. So I made sure that all the air was out and I kind of rinsed the top of it before I recycled it. So for aluminum, um, any kind of beverage cans and foil pans, um, bakery, cookies, um, there's certain, you know, sometimes when you serve a lot of people, you have big pans that you heat things up in. The important thing is these are clean. You can also do aluminum foil if it's going over something to protect it or while you're baking or cooking. As long as it's clean, you can um, kind of ball it up and recycle it. And then we have uh, mixed paper, which would be newspaper, office paper, magazines, junk mail, um, and then cartons. Cartons are the beverage, the soup, the juice boxes, those are all um, high fiber, long fiber paper that um, the paper recyclers and the mills want. And you can also recycle cardboard. And what we ask you to do is flatten the boxes and flatten um, you know, the, the cardboard boxes and flatten them before they go in the recycling cart. Last year, I talked a little bit about the impacts of the national sword um, from China policy, where we were no longer able to export large amounts of our recycling um, due to the high level of contamination that were in them. So China said, if you're going to send us any recycling, 
it can't have less more than 0.5 percent contamination, which is really minuscule and very difficult to do with the type of material recovery facilities we have. So it's really important for the consumer to make sure that um, everything that I've said is done to make sure that the markets that are available to accept these materials know that they're clean. Um, we're working on building a, a bigger infrastructure here in the states of uh, doing some more manufacturing here than having to rely on, on other countries, but it's something that doesn't happen overnight. But um, something that has happened overnight, it seems like with COVID-19, is our financial system and our markets are further down, um, kind of in the toilet, proverbial toilet, than they have been in a very long time. To give you an idea, um, in 2011, a ton of recycling was valued at $140 a ton. In 2020, right now, one ton of recyclables is valued at $25. That's a huge hit for recyclers who rely on these materials for revenue, and also for end markets who rely on these materials for feedstock. Um, recycling is probably going to be changing in the future. Um, what do I mean by that? I think that there'll be some new technologies out there for sorting, to do better sorting. I think that there'll be some innovation out there to utilize some of the lower grade materials that don't have good market values like mixed paper and mixed plastics. A lot of the films in the bags that are going into the garbage now they're finding new uses for those. And then the Product Steward Institute is looking at extended producer responsibility for manufacturers to take back and to take the onerous of managing their material and trying to get it into the circular economy to use it again. So there are some, it, it, there's hope, there's good things. There's a lot of benefits still for recycling. It does conserve resources um, from having to use Raw material, although right now for plastics, the, the virgin material is cheaper than the recycled material. So what commitment do the brand sponsors have to use the recycled content? And a lot of times it comes down to policy and it comes down to um, corporate um, sustainability. So for right now, um, there is a lot of unknown um, with this industry but it has been a viable, it's been a big job creator, it's been good for the environment. So my advice to you is let's just keep going, let's do it right and um, have hope that um, we come up with um, better recycling as we go forward. So remember it's about quality rather than quantity. So many of us don't have an opportunity to go visit a material recovery facility to see how our materials get sorted. So it's a business, um, it's very dirty, it's loud, the machines are constantly going, um, there's not a lot of room to walk. And so what I thought I'd do is show you just a little video of the inside of a material recovery facility and how materials do get sorted when consumers make the conscious effort to put them in the curbside cart, empty, clean, and loose. materials are being depleted and a huge amount of energy is being used to make products from raw materials. Our current recycling efforts in America are falling short. A basic understanding of how recycling works will make us all better recyclers. Let's go behind the scenes to better understand the recycling journey. Our journey begins at the curb on pickup day. The recyclables that you've placed in your recycle cart are picked up by our driver then delivers it to our material recovery facility. Here, material is sorted by type. Once the truck is weighed, our driver dumps the material. The material is loaded in our drum feeder. The drum feeder distributes the material evenly onto a conveyor belt. The material then makes its way to the first sorting station. 
Workers sort through the materials to remove items that cannot be recycled at our facility, like plastic bags, toys, and electronics. Next, rubber stars rotate to separate cardboard from other recyclable materials. Additional screens help the flow of material by sending paper over the screen and containers below. Workers remove any remaining non-recyclable items. Paper and cardboard is then sent to our baler, where it is compacted into large bales. Now that the cardboard and paper has been removed and bailed, let's sort the remaining material. Glass pieces fall through our fine screen and make their way to the glass collection area. As the containers continue through the system, the tin cans are pulled out using a magnet. The rest of the containers are sorted using one of our T-Tech machines, which looks at each container and separates it by type using first surveyor. Aluminum cans are separated by what we call an eddy current. The eddy current is a special magnet which repels the cans into their own storage container. Once sorted, material is sent to the container baler, where separate recyclables are compacted into bales. are loaded onto trucks, which transport the materials to various facilities to be transformed into new products. Together, with proper recycling, we can each continue to save landfill space, conserve energy, and protect our planet's natural resources. It's really amazing to see the bulk of it <laughs> like that. So that's nice. That that's really a clean MRF. Um, I've been in several, and that really that's done in Homewood um, disposal, and, and they they did a nice job with their video. And what I wanted to remind you is when you make the effort to recycle the, the recycle right the materials that I've talked about, those materials are feedstock to make new products. And it, re it reduces the need for, to extract raw materials and it conserves energy and it saves water. Um, and oftentimes it's hard to visualize how things get chipped up, um, melted down and remade into new products. So I have one particularly of cartons that I'd like to show you because carton recycling is rather new in the recycling stream. Not everywhere has the opportunity to recycle milk cartons, juice boxes, um, broth, Tetra Pak um, kinds of containers. And so this is from the Carton Council. Is this available on the Swank website also? I know the last one was. No, um, I don't know if we have this one listed. Um, I can ask Lisa to put it on or I can send it to you as a follow-up. It's on the Carton Council's um, website. Mm -hmm.
That would be recyclecartons.com if you saw that. What's unique about this um, Carton Council, it's a stakeholder group of manufacturers who make the different cartons. And over the last 10 years, they've gone throughout um, different areas, states and, and countries, um, working with the MRF operators to give them money to um, enhance their technology to be able to sort these cartons. They don't get sorted on the conveyor belt per se, like newspaper and cardboard. They, they are captured and bailed as cartons, not with other paper. Um, and there's a whole unique process because they've got plastic. They've got a layer of plastic. It's not wax, it's plastic. And then they have a layer of aluminum that it, it's within the reprocessing of those that um, they, this council has figured out how to do the reprocessing to pull those long fi paper fibers and to it, separate out the other materials. So it's, it's pretty fascinating um, if you care to look at their website sometime. So this is my slide of um, common things that are put in the curbside recycling cart that I just really like to go over to again say, please don't. Um, I, I have up top, please remember empty, clean, and loose because the pictures that you see are not what to do. That's what these little guys are. It's like, don't do that. So if you're going to recycle your Gatorade bottle, please don't smash it and please make sure it's empty. No greasy pizza boxes. If you happen to get pizza and you have the pizza on the bottom that gets soaked and saturated, um, but that top cardboard is fine. You can split it apart and recycle the clean, but don't recycle the dirty. And then we have the um, yogurt container here that still has quite, um, a lot of yogurt in it. In order to recycle that, that needs to be clean. And then of course, these recyclables are bagged and that is um, a no more, no more bags in the recycling um, so cart. But other things that um, recyclers have said during the vetting process, um, they often see tanks and explosives and they see cords and garden hoses, um, strands of lights, hangers. Um, those are called um, tanglers. And as you can imagine that with the star um, sorting that you see um, going around quickly, that gets, um, tangled quite quickly and stops the operation. And then it can be dangerous to cut it out. It can be a long time to clean it out. And so it's just really um, undesirable to get any of those items in, in the curbside bin. Plus, they don't have the same commodity market that these recyclers are dealing with. Um, these are all niche materials and they may have recycling or reuse programs on their own, but not through the curbside cart. And then no disposables, no, no cutlery, if I can get my little arrow down here, no straws, no plastic cutlery, no styrofoam, plastic cups of any kind, takeout containers, paper plastic plates, those are all garbage. I have the no shredded paper here because people say, oh, well, I put my shredded paper in a bag, a paper bag, and I put it in my recycling cart. Well, yeah, it's paper and paper can be recycled, but not shredded paper because it can't, it gets all over the place. When it gets into the truck and it gets pressured, um, it kind of explodes like confetti. Or when it's back at the material recovery facility, it gets, if it's on the floor, it starts getting into aluminum and it gets into glass and it contaminates those loads. So as I say, it's like catching a fart in a windstorm. It can't be quantified and it can't be collected that way. So eventually Swank's um, one day shredding events will be happening again. Everything right now is suspended due to COVID-19. So things will eventually get going again. And if you have an abundance of, of paper that documents, um, especially sensitive documents that have personal information, Clearbrook and Palatine, you can go um, any time of the year. Uh, I mean, they have certain days of drop-offs, but they have adults with disabilities that, and they're certified to shred paper. And it's a very nominal fee to pay um, to get your paper shredded. 
So there's other ways to get paper shredded and recycled rather than put it in, do not put it in the curbside cart. And then of course, don't put batteries, electronics, no plastic bags or film. Um, collect those separately and you can take those back to a retail store. Right now, again, some of the stores are um, pulled their collection container for plastic bags and film um, with the COVID-19. Eventually that will probably loosen up and resume. Um, there is a website, plasticbagrecycling.org that has a lot of different information about those materials and who takes them and what they're used for. Mary. Yeah. There's a few questions that pertain to this slide, but we can, should we get, cover those at the end instead of jumping um, in? No, let me just uh, mention the last two and then I can take questions. Okay. Um, I'm trying, we have a few slides to go and uh, it's 10 to eight. So maybe I should finish my presentation and then sure. um, answer the questions. Or maybe you could ask me if there's a couple burning ones that are very common, um, I could address those right away. Well, so again, no needles. Um, Swank has a program for needles and sharps, we call them where you can get a biohazard container. You can put your needles in that container and then take it um, to a lot of different um, locations um, within the region, um, as well as medications. There are a lot of police departments now that are taking not the creams, not the over-the-counter kind of stuff, but pills. So Nancy, why don't you hit me with a couple and then- Okay, we'll so um, one question was about like 16 ounce water bottles if they still have a little water in them, does it matter if there's a little water in them? Well, it's just to best to be empty. Okay. To follow instructions, will a little bit of water hurt? Um, will a little bit of Gatorade hurt? It's it's just the protocol that others follow, I think, when when things, I, I, I think it's empty needs to be empty. Okay. And then um, um, there was a question about brown paper bags from grocery stores what to do with those can those yeah so brown paper bags like a trader joe's bag as long as it's clean can be recycled okay okay and then um let's see um another person has their hand raised i don't know what her question is but so let's hold on to that question until a little bit later and then we'll let mary continue with the rest of the slides um we did have a, a guest who's a patron who sent in a picture um, which I could share that photo. It's got a few um, items on it and he wanted to know if those are recyclable. So okay, and the other thing well, too, Nancy, oh, weird, I you? know that this was supposed to go for an hour or is it longer than an hour? I think if, I said an hour and a half, but, but. Oh, okay, then we have plenty of time. I just, if anybody has to get off and has questions post um, this presentation, my email address is mary, M-A-R-Y, at swank s-w-a-n-c-c dot org. I have that information at the end of this presentation, but if you have to jump off and you need to contact me, that's the best way to do it. Okay. So, so important, education, education, education. I just feel, I go to bed at night and I feel that the day is not done yet because there's still more to educate tomorrow. Um, some of it is because there are sometimes things change. And, and sometimes it's just not, I'm not sure the best way to get the information to the resident. So I ask you listening to this presentation to help your families, help your neighbors, share the information that you know, um, because this is really current stuff. And maybe they haven't had a, you know, been really tuned into the recycling industry and what's been going on like you have. So please share your wisdom and your um, your knowledge. With education, it really has to do, if you look at this container and you look at this container, this you might say is garbage because it's your typical black container with a black bag. Okay, so this is blue and blue could be a recycling bin and it's got a different color liner on it. And oftentimes for outside stuff, liners will be used but when this goes into the recycling dumpster, they can be just offloaded, emptied from the plastic. Um, you can collect in plastic, you just can't put it in the end um, dumpster. But it doesn't tell you what. 
And so it's really important to keep that going. Um, this is one that I saw at an airport in Portland um, in March, my, my last trip um, before we were all locked down. And I really like this. So what goes in this slot? Rather than assuming people know, it tells you newspapers and magazines. What goes in this round hole? Cans and plastic bottles. And it has pictures or graphics of each of those. And then down here, it says no cups. I really, really like this information. It's, it's concise, it's got the graphics, it's got the words. Whether people follow that, you can't control, but this is your best chance of getting a good stream of recycling. When it's like this, with the, just the black um, garbage cart next to the recycling bin, that's good. You need to have side-by-side -side containers, but chances are you're gonna get 50% of recycling in your garbage and 50% of garbage in your recycling when it's like this. Um, when I do my waste audits, that's pretty much the rule of thumb. And in schools, these have been really nice. Swink has a grant program that has um, given schools money to get sophisticated um, sorting tables, they're called. These particularly are nice because right where you do the pitching um, and also right around the can has the educational information. And outside is no different. It needs to be labeled and people need to know what to put in those holes. And, um, and, and as a result, I think we get a cleaner stream. Jumping to another part of recycling that oftentimes gets overlooked is food composting. Many of your neighbors um, have ride-along programs, they have a subscription program, um, or they have um, backyard composting. So before we move on, um, by composting food organics with landscape organics, um, it really provides a wonderful soil amendment for um, growing great food and also um, fortifying our soil that is oftentimes um, eroded. It reduces greenhouse gas emissions. It really helps, um, it mitigates um, flood control um, when there's heavy rains, if you have compost in your soil. It helps hold the moisture. Um, it sequesters carbon. There are just wonderful things that um, compost will do um, instead of putting them in our landfills. And the other, um, so if you have a service provider for either the Ride Along program or a subscription program, curbside, that's great, but you can do this at home with fruits and vegetables in your own backyard. You can, there's different, there's tumblers. This is the little art, black R2D2, I call it from Star Wars. Um, but there's tumblers, there's open pits. The, the thing that you need to be more, most mindful about with backyard composting is to follow any village ordinances that they have um, associated with spacing and um, whether you have to have an enclosed bin um, versus an open bin. So the website, the village's website would have that information or Swank has it on our website on behalf of our communities. Worm composting is something I've done for over 20 years. Um, I have one in my office just like this, where it's layered with um, bedding and food and the worms migrate up to where the food is. And then you're just switching out trays. And I, in fact, today I cleaned it out and I had a huge bucket of compost that my coworker took home because she's doing a, a large landscaping project. And then some of you may be familiar with focaccia, which is just fermenting um, fruits and vegetables in a bucket over time. When you open it up, it'll blow your nose away. But oh my goodness, it, it happens rather quickly. And then you can use, um, add that to the compost and it's already degraded a great deal to um, break down. There um, is a lot of information about those three composting um, methods at Illinois Food Scrap Coalition. And Nancy, I can follow up with some of the resources for you if you'd like to share um, via email with all of the attendees. Great. So just real quick, um, before I get to your questions right now, Swank's um, document destruction, all of the municipal special material programs are suspended 
We have just opened up our transfer station Saturday mornings from 9 to 1130, just last week, to accept electronics. And we hope by the first week of June to open up Mount Prospect, Hoffman Estates, and Winnetka for electronics. Um, we're, it looks like maybe July will be our very first one-day event. Um, Elk Grove Village was supposed to have theirs on June 6, and they have um, rescheduled theirs for August 29th. Um, the household chemical waste locations, there's four of them in Illinois. And right now, the only one that has reopened um, and will reopen this Saturday is in Naperville. That information is located on Swank's website under chemicals. Can I just add here, I um, in moving out of my old house where I had lots of years worth of materials and items and chemicals and things, I use the Swank website to locate places to take this stuff. So one of them was the Naperville um, chemical waste place. I took like a trunk full of stuff that was in my garage from <laughs> for like 25 or more years. Um, also uh, from that list there were places I brought a set of encyclopedias to a place that took old books like that that nobody else wanted and anyway it was just a great that's the, the Swank website gave me answers to like four or five different needs that I had. So I was able to get that properly recycled <laughs> instead of just- Oh, that's nice to know, thank yeah. you. And I have um, a little thing at the very end about the website and a couple of our um, highly used um, resources. There's something that I, I wanted to say, no, batteries, please do not put them in your recycling bin. Yes, batteries can be recycled and there are some programs for them. Um, however, um, alkaline batteries are not made with heavy metals. They're not made with toxic material and can, according to the EP, US EPA, be thrown away in the garbage. I know a lot of people don't like to hear that, but they can safely be put in the garbage. Um, it is the rechargeable batteries that have um, heavy metals and toxic materials in them and recyclability. But now um, the lithium batteries are actually kind of replacing the alkaline batteries because they're supercharged. Um, the primary single use bat lithium batteries look amazingly similar to the alkaline. I have the lithium here and the the alkaline here. The only way really to tell is to look on the label. Um, these batteries can be recycled at Home Depot, at Lowe's, at Menards, at Ikea. There are many places that will take them. Um, something I wanted to tell you about the lithium batteries that even when they stop operating your um, home appliances like say electric toothbrush, it may not run that electric toothbrush, but when you take it out, it still is about 30% charged. Um, and so what you need to know is when you want to wait to collect some, to take them to a recycling plate, to, to, to get them recycled, do not leave them just sitting in a container or in a drawer. For that reason, they can spark a fire if they get um, hit or if they touch terminals. So the best thing to do is to tape the terminal end with a duct tape or an electrical tape. And then, or if you don't have that tape, you can put single lithium batteries in a plastic baggie. I know that's using a lot of plastic baggies, but it's for your safety um, in your home, not to burn yourself down and not to cause damage in a, in a garbage truck or at the transfer station as well. Because um, by law, residents can throw all of these batteries away. But when there's recycling and rescue programs, recovery programs, it's prudent to utilize those um, for the reasons that we don't want the toxicity in our landfills and we don't um, want the, the fires started either. So be very mindful of lithium batteries, particularly um, as they grow in number to um, operate our electronics and our um, household electronics uh, and, and products. So let me just, um, Swank's website at swank.org, up here you can see um, the, the big headings. This reuse and recycling directory, if you click on that, 
to your right then will drop down items um, that you're looking to reuse or recycle or safely dispose of um, in alphabetical order. So if it was say, I want to look at paint, you would click on recycling directory and go down to P for paint. And there will be vendors there that will, um, that recycle paint or um, e-paint recycling in Arlington Heights is working with a lot of Ace Hardware stores for latex paint. And you can get on that website to get that information. Um, for chemicals, if you wanted to know the Naperville place, the Chicago, the Rockford, or the Gurney, you click on chemicals and then there's um, on that page all that information. We have our programs here that will consist of a calendar once we get things scheduled. It's rather new. So by month, you can see where Swank's one day events are um, and any Swank resident can attend any of the community events. No businesses, no schools, no institutions. It's just for residential. Um, and then we have the closing the loop brochure I talked about. Nancy in here, we have scarce listed. So if you do the book rescue program, the surplus supplies, we have a lot of different organizations, industry, um, composting, and just waste reduction um, ideas in this one. And then our three guides. One is the eco landscape guide, our eco friendly marketplace, and our eco cleaning guide. Um, all can be up downloaded. Or if you ever want to have a hard copy, just contact me and I would be happy to mail them to you. And lastly on this slide, um, please join us on Facebook. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter um, and sign up for our e-list if you aren't already on, on getting our, our monthly newsletter because that's our, our website and our news once a month. It's not really a newsletter. It's really more of a news blurb. And it has all the timely information that you need for our programs. And I always like to end with make, make Every Day Earth Day. This is a calendar that I used to do just for the month of April because that was Environmental Awareness Month. And this year, I have not dated it. I have 35 different ideas with resources on the reverse side that can be downloaded from the agency's website. And it's timeless. It doesn't have a year and it doesn't have a month. So um, it was pretty ingenious to do that this year with COVID-19 uh, dominating <laughs> April and not having me be in person anywhere. Um, and I'm very thankful for Zoom platform to be able to stay connected um, to, be, to do my presentations that way. I would imagine for anybody with kids, that would be a very nice thing to have to share some ideas of activities with and I try and make it for adults too. It used to be just for kids, but there are some things that probably kids wouldn't be interested in getting more information about, but you might. Um, so I do um, recommend that you check it out on our website. And then lastly, thank you for um, anything that you're willing to do to prevent waste, to recycle right, and to compost and share your knowledge with your neighbors and your friends, because it, it, it aids to the community reaching a sustainability level and reducing your carbon footprint and being a good neighbor. And those are all really, really important to move forward in a sustainable fashion. Um, there's no sense in going backwards. Let's move forward with the technology and the knowledge that we have to have a better future for future generations. So thank you very much for this opportunity to to be here tonight with you. And with any time we have left, I would be more than happy to answer questions. Do you have a photograph that I can share? If you don't mind, I'll sh this is a picture of a few things. If, um, oh, that's right. Other, yeah. other people might have the same question. So let me find that. Hold on a second. Okay, so it's, oh, our Elk Grove Library plastic bag. So plastic bags, and I assume that that is a, um, like a padded paper Amazon package. So um, let's start with this. So this plastic bag, probably if it's plastic, can go in the, the retail bags. The you know, library one? The, the only thing I would say, not knowing who this is, um, if, if it's a PLA, if it's a compostable one, you can't mix that with traditional plastic. It will be a contaminant. 
So if it's truly just plastic, it can go in the retail bag, um, in the retail box, like so at Mariano's. It, like at Jewel or Mariano's where they- And this little pillow pack can as well. Oh, okay. Oh, over here. Okay. And then in the middle, um, I'm pretty sure that if I peek inside of this, it's going to be more paper. It's padded with paper. Um, I have one like it in my display kit. Um, however, the, 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 if it's bubble wrap on the inside, it would be garbage. But I think it's the one with the padded paper. It's their new one because they were getting um, a lot of customers talking poorly against the plastic ones that are garbage. Um, so the paper one, if it's got the paper in it can be recycled. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing this. Let's see. All right, so there is um, another question. Um, uh, someone is curious about yogurt containers since they're single use. Um, he said, I found one that's available in glass. I assume that it is a better choice since glass is more easily recyclable. Please tell me I'm right. Don't, don't be discouraged with plastic yogurt containers. Um, what I do, will tell you is it's impossible to, it, the recyclers don't want the number six. They don't want polystyrene. And oftentimes like Activa is a number six. It can't be recycled. But I do Chobani and I do Trader Joe's and those are fours. And the four plastic can be recycled. So it's hard to tell you not to look at numbers and then tell you to look at numbers um, on those particular containers. That's the only way you'll find out if, it's, if something is a number six is by looking at the numbers. And so don't recycle number sixes, um, but fours and fives are fine. Okay. Okay, here's another question. Um, and glass is fine too. Okay. Yes, um, no bubble wrap. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm reading the question. So no bubble wrap can go in recycling, correct? No. Okay, and then um, so baby food jars, since those are smaller than three inches in diameter, those would probably be not, um, can't go in loose at least, right? You know, my recommendation is ask your recycler Ask your recycler about that. Ask waste management about that. Um, it was kind of, it's, it's a gray area. I know unequivocally bottle caps are too small. Baby jars are a little bit, maybe two inches. They're not quite the three. So that is to me a gray area. Um, and it depends on the sorting at the technology, you know, the technology at the, the MRF. I would say if you really wanted to know, if you have a lot of baby food jars, um, to ask somebody um, at, at waste management. Okay. And if you need contact Nan through Nancy, I can, I can find out too. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna put my email address here too. So if anybody wants to contact me, um, oops, uh, you can, ask a question through me, but I know Mary's really good at answering questions when you email her, so. I do mine too. Yeah. Um, anybody else have a question for something that you're always wondering about, whether it needs to go in the garbage or the recycling? I know I'm always yelling at my kids, and um, I shouldn't say that because they're probably in earshot right now, but <laughs> Chipotle um, with the, the aluminum covers from the Chipotle bowls. I often find them in the garbage and I'm pulling them out saying, aluminum can be recycled, people. <laughs> so I think they've gotten my message now and now, they're, now they do it. Um, there are um, simple signs on Swank's website. If you go to swank.org um, under resources, you can get recycling signs that you can download and print. So whether it's your business or uh, maybe uh, um, your place of worship, or even just for your very own recycling container at home, there's some real simple um, signs that you can print. So go to resources. Oh, you've got them. Okay. okay. We have them in Spanish. I even have one in Polish, although it's not printed. So if any of you have um, staff that are Polish, um, 
I have the three languages right now and the very big. So the real base, basic is glass, aluminum, cartons, and bottles. Um, I use that a lot when I'm at schools and cafeterias just by reminding people that it's about quality rather than quantity and just to really go after a few things rather than too many things and have an abundance of contamination. Um, and if you're looking for something that's not there, um, and I have composting ones too. So if, if you're looking for something particular that you don't see, let me know. And, and we can either try and create it in the office or maybe I, it's just not posted. Oh, um, another person asked, I recently learned the term wish cycling instead of recycling, wish cycling, and realized that I've been guilty of that. <laughs> so that was a question. I think, a you know, I think a lot of people are. You, we're, you have good intentions and you think, because it's made of plastic or something that looks like it should go in the recycling bin, uh, cart. Um, but unfortunately, with the crackdown of contamination as a result of the Chinese um, national sword policy is when this has all come to light because our recyclers have let us get by with contaminating our bins for many years. Revenue stream, the revenue for the materials was at a, a high, and they were still making money with the contamination and they didn't have to deal with landfilling it because China had to do that. So it, it just all kind of crashed down on us all at one time. And um, to me, it's nobody's fault but the haulers, the recyclers that stand to benefit from um, doing recycling right. Um, they, they need to do better with the education and to make sure they're spot on with their MRFs and to communicate that to their customers. Because mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I don't get paid, um, you know, if your recycling is good or bad. It, I, I don't benefit from that, except my heart is good when you do good. Um, well, we're really like lucky. to see them do more education. We're really lucky then that our communities, Elk Grove is part of, the, a part of Swank, so that we have the benefit of all your education to, <laughs> to learn how to do better. Uh, thanks. Well, that's that's our commitment to our communities and haulers don't always like that either because <laughs> when it comes time to contract, um, we've got a, an expert in our office that works closely with each community with their contract to make sure they get the biggest bang for their buck. And, um, you know, we don't, the haulers know that they're not going to um, sham the community because we've got their back. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think it's just, uh, you know, it's you, something like this and continued learning like through the Swank website is so important because, you know, we're all busy, but you, need, you don't quite know what happens to things once you put them in that bin and just to learn, just to see the process that things go through and the, um, quantity, like when you're showing the video um, of the MRF, um, just to see that is very inspiring and pushes us all, I think, to try to do better, do a little bit more, be more aware of what we could do differently. You know what, Nancy, it all boils down to it's, it's what we can do to contribute to the greater part of having a nice environment and a sustainable future. And I think that that, especially right now, it, people need to feel worthy and they need to feel that they can have a, a, a greater impact. And this is where we can do it. Okay. By first of all, not making the waste. The reduce is so important. You know, not making the waste to have to manage it or to have to recycle it is, is the best. So if when restaurants open up, Maybe you'll take your own reusable um, containers. So if you have leftovers, you don't have to take styrofoam or, or a disposable, you can take your own. And I think that we're going to have some challenges getting back into the, you know, for germs and people touching things and bringing your own things in. But in the sh supermarkets, continue using your reusable bags. They ask that we, um, if we do, that we leave the reusable bag in the shopping cart. So do it. It's easy. They're superior to plastic. We shouldn't go backwards. So those are things that we can continue doing, our commitment to reusing. 
um, and not wasting. So um, we're going to get through this and things will open up again and it'll look maybe a little bit different, but it's all of the same importance as we move forward with sustainability practices. Thank you everybody for for uh, tuning in or whatever you call this, zooming in with us tonight and um, especially thanks to Mary for, for all your great information. So thank you again for the opportunity and good night, everyone.